It seems like today that debt is an ever more prevalent part of the narrative of modern financial crises. People were over leveraged on some financial market, or the home mortgages that we've based our entire financial sector around have blown up, or some country tanked its entire economy by borrowing just a little bit too much, and even today, our over-reliance on debt means that we can't take our foot off the accelerator of economic growth even for a second to address a very real health crisis because we are afraid it will make our delicate economic system collapse. The common denominator amongst all of this is debt. Now I'm not talking about the bad debt like credit cards or car loans, personal loans, payday loans or whatever it is that normally takes the flack of irresponsible consumers. I am talking about the stuff that most economists actually agree is good debt. But is this really the case? Is there such thing as good debt? And how could something good cause so many issues? On top of this, is there any way that we could run an economy without debt? And would we be better off for doing so? Well, it turns out we probably can. And in fact, there are many economies around the world today that are developing rapidly while going without this system that we just assume is a given. If we can critically explore these questions, it will offer insight into how our modern financial system works and why it means that despite our best efforts, we are almost destined to go into a recession once every 10 years or so. But before we get into any of that, let's explore why debt may not be anything to fear at all. So it looks like debt is pretty terrible, and on top of that, nobody wants to be in it. But it looks like it's almost impossible to live a life in a modern world without it. All of that being said though, if we were to take an argument for debt, we would have to argue that it is a tool that enables people to make constructive contributions towards an economy sooner than they would have been able to otherwise. If we have a farmer that wants to grow corn to feed the world, well they aren't going to be able to do that without a farm. Now, in our modern world, this isn't a big deal. The farmer can just save up a small deposit and then use this to take out a loan to buy a farm. This is effectively leverage. It gives an industrious individual like our farmer here the ability to amplify the small amount of money he has to actually start producing things of value. In this case, the bank earns some interest to profit off, the farmer gets a home to live in and a business to derive income from, and society gets a business that will contribute to their greater benefit. Kind of sounds like a win-win all around, right? Well, sure. The idea of one's potential not necessarily being limited by how much money they have is truly a liberating idea. And the optimistic outcome of this is that the best ideas and best businesses get funded and everyone benefits from this collective capacity. People may rightfully ask a logical question, which is that, well, if one person has been loaned money, someone is having to do the loaning, shouldn't they just use that money on their own ideas instead of giving it out with interest stipulations? And wouldn't this just cause a group of elites that just sit on top of an ever-increasing pile of money? Well, firstly, yes, it does. Today, we call them the financial sector, and people love to hate them, but that doesn't really matter here so long as they are actually making the world a better place. So why aren't they just using their own money to fund their own projects then? Well, sometimes people with lots of money don't necessarily have great ideas. And beyond that, the way our modern monetary system works Banks are not moving money from one place to another to write these loans. They are creating money out of nothing and securing their position with the promise that this money will be paid back. It sounds very silly, and we explain it in much more detail on our video concerning modern monetary theory, but what is important to know for now is that it effectively creates the money we need to do good stuff now without taking it away from anybody else, even temporarily. So, it's all roses then, right? Of course not. This is the positive narrative of good debt, or leverage, or project finance, or whatever the creditors want to call it to make it sound like an essential service. This whole system here makes some massive assumptions. It assumes that only sensible projects are funded. It assumes that the interest rate doesn't outpace the level of wealth creation. It assumes that money is loaned directly towards wealth generating endeavors, and finally, it also assumes that people need loans, or else nothing would ever get off the ground. In reality, of course, all of these assumptions are iffy at best, or downright wrong at worst. We all know that all manner of stuff is financed in our economy, from that new pair of jeans bought on someone's credit card to a more serious purchase like a home. Home loans make up a majority of the total finance in most modern economies, but houses are not productive assets. Sure. They provide places for people to live, but at the end of the day, they are just inert buildings that don't really produce anything 
or even produce jobs beyond minor repairs in the initial construction. And then there is the other big thing. Do people actually need these loans? Debt is so intertwined with our economies and daily lives that we more or less take it for granted and don't stop to consider if it is something that is actually a requirement. And I'm not talking about that weird random guy that never borrows any money because the banks are out to get you so they live in their parents' basement and inherit everything they own. I am talking about an entire economy that doesn't have debt. It would certainly have its advantages. I mean, just off the bat, things like irresponsible lending on credit cards would be completely eliminated, which is probably going to be a big win. But what about the beer purchases in life? Well, this would be pretty rough overall, right? If I need a car to drive to work or a house to live in, but I can't save that money, I'm pretty much screwed, right? And if I can't get to work, how am I going to be a good economic participant? Well, the thing is, living in a world without debt would massively disrupt the normal balance of supply and demand for these kinds of items. Let's take housing for example. There is a relatively constrained supply of dwellings within the range of a typical CBD, and of those there are only a few hundred for sale at any given time. So supply is relatively inelastic, but demand is an interesting part of all of this. Demand is ultimately a function of the number of people who are willing and able to buy something. Now this is especially important when it comes to things like housing. Almost everybody is willing to buy a house. Shelter is a basic human need, and when the alternative is living on the street or even worse with your in-laws, you are going to be pretty damn willing to either rent or buy a place of your own. The issue comes in the ability part of the demand function. Chances are, most of you watching don't have the hundreds of thousands or sometimes millions of dollars in cash needed to buy a home in most developed cities around the world. And if you are one of the lucky few, how you doing? Patreon link in the video description. Anyway, what this means for most of us is that if we want a home, we either rent it or we have to go and get a home loan. If we can't get a home loan, well, we're out of luck. And we're pretty much destined to rent forever. Now, if home loans didn't exist, we would all be in the same boat here, which means that demand would fall sharply because there are less people that are able to buy a house. As this demand falls, so too will prices, which means that soon enough, it will become feasibly possible to just save up and buy a house in cash. It would still be a very long process requiring a lot of discipline, but once you own the house, it would be yours. Now there are some arguments that this would cause wealthy people to just sit on top of a vast pile of homes and that they could just buy up all of these properties because they would be the only people with capital to do so. But realistically, this is already what happens today, so it's not like debt is some huge saving grace here. What may be affected though, is construction of new homes. Supply and demand goes two ways. If price falls, builders will not be incentivized to build new homes. Given the money that goes into a new home construction, it may just not be financially possible. The same kind of effect would be true for cars. Just because debt doesn't exist, it wouldn't mean that it won't cost $100,000 to build a McMansion or $20,000 to assemble a car. Component costs may come down slightly, but at the end of the day, people are not going to hire staff or pay for materials to build something that won't turn a profit. Now, if we are building less houses and cars or whatever else in an economy, that means we have less material wealth, which is a really bad outcome for a modern economy because at the end of the day, it's an economy's job to provide wealth to the participants in that economy. One could argue that this is more or less game over for this debt-free society, but not necessarily. Short term, sure, you can achieve more by leveraging up, but this is kind of akin to an elite athlete taking all manner of performance enhancing goodies. To really stretch this analogy, an elite athlete filled to the brim with roids will compete better in the short term than an athlete relying simply on a good diet, training and exercise. But that athlete is also more likely to cark it at the age of 35. The financial crises that we lurch between decade to decade are debt crises. I mean, we just take them for granted today. We are even taught that they are just part of the business cycle. 
but these are potentially a sign that we are asking too much out of our system in the same way that the first athlete is asking too much out of their body in the short term. Saving for everything you buy is certainly less sexy, and you won't see the results nearly as quickly, but long term, it may lead to a more sustainable prosperity. Fortunately though, we don't necessarily need to speculate about this absurd hypothetical because it already kind of exists in our modern world today. For a very, very long time, banking as we know it today with loans and interest rates did not really exist. The reason being was that religions that prevailed around the world strictly forbid the collection of interest for the loaning of money. It was seen as immoral to demand money off your fellow man simply because you had money and they didn't. It was known as usury. Now, morality arguments aside, this whole thing eventually broke down in Europe and across the world when nations needed to fund increasingly expensive wars. And perhaps the only way to win was to take out a loan, given that your opponent was likely going to be doing the same to fund an ever more expensive arsenal of equipment. Something along the lines of the first casualty of war being morals. Anyway, banking eventually won out and today we have the incredibly complex system that facilitates most trades in our day-to-day -day lives. But there is still a bastion of the financial sector that has gone without charging interest to this very day. Institutions like Dubai Bank, Al Raji Banking and Investment Corporation and Q8 Finance House are all Islamic financial institutions, which still adhere to the ideology that charging interest is wrong and so they don't do it. So how then do these banks exist? They would never be able to make a profit by lending money to people in a typical way, so they don't do it. You can't go into any of these banks and get a loan or a credit card, or even for that matter, a savings account. Interest is completely off the table. What they do instead is act as institutions that direct capital towards what they see as wise investments. If you wanted to go out and buy a home, these banks would not give you a home loan. What they would do instead is buy a house that they feel has a good market potential and make you a deal. You be our tenant for X amount of years and at the end of that contract, we will give you a house. Now this ultimately achieves the same thing. People are paying in increments for a property that they could not afford up front, but the big distinction is that the bank themselves owns the property. So there is a much stronger incentive for them to make sure that they are investing into something that is worthwhile long term because at any point, the people living in the home could just stop paying the rent and move somewhere else. And the bank would not be able to chase them up because they didn't actually hold a debt. In a typical home loan, the bank is protected by two layers of assets. They have the mortgage contract itself, which is a contract that legally makes the borrower obliged to pay this amount for this long. And if all of that goes downhill, they can repossess and sell the house as an option of last resort. This alternative type of banking does not have that first layer level of security. This gets even more interesting when you consider businesses. Banks like these will not give loans to businesses, but they will instead invest directly into businesses or projects that they think are going to turn a profit. Again, this means that these banks will ultimately be exposed to the decisions that they make and they need to ensure the fundamentals of the business is sound rather than just relying on the fact that they can repossess owner's equity if needed. The final piece of the puzzle is savings. Now most banks around the world today will still offer some kind of savings account that attracts an interest rate. Save your money with us and we'll give you 2% interest or whatever it may be. The problem here is that that is still technically a debt. It's just a debt that the bank owes you. You are collecting interest and you will eventually want your money back. So how would savings work in these kinds of banks? Well, they still have accounts where you can keep your money. It's just that instead of paying you interest, you share in the profits of the bank. It's still extremely secure and there are normally clauses that nobody will ever lose money. But if the bank doesn't make a profit in a given year, their savers might not make any money either. Now the things like credit cards, personal loans, car loans, all of that stuff that most people agree is pretty bad debt, well, rather unshockingly I suppose, these banks just don't offer those kinds of products. Having equity exposure to an economy rather than debt exposure is in many ways a more responsible way to ensure that money gets to where it needs to go 
and that the people at the controls of the economic system have a vested interest in long-term sustainable growth rather than writing up just one more loan contract. There is no getting around the fact that we are addicted to debt today. It drives our modern monetary system and facilitates our growth and development. We use it for an ever-increasing amount of things in our daily lives. 50 years ago, it was likely that most people only ever had a home loan. But today, it's a home loan, a car loan, student debt, a maxed out credit card and a new plasma screen TV that you're paying off over a 12 month interest free offer. We are the economy of making tomorrow pay for it, but we potentially haven't realized that tomorrow will come. It is extremely unlikely that we will ever adapt a system that doesn't have debt. To walk back from where we are now would unfortunately be nearly impossible. But perhaps by properly understanding what it is that debt does, what it can be used for, what its limitations are, and what alternative exists, we can properly utilize credit in our own lives. We may not be able to completely revert this system, but if nothing else, we can know that debt is not a given. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you did enjoy the video, please consider liking and subscribing. If you really enjoyed, please consider supporting the channel over on Patreon like these lovely people did. I also want to hear your opinions on the subject, so you can share those over on our Q&A session, hosted on our second channel, or on our Discord server, linked in the video description. Thanks guys, bye.